Welcome to EWTN Live. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and this is a program where we bring you guests from all around the world. Tonight, we'll talk with an award-winning organist, composer, and conductor about the role of music in the liturgy and how sacred music can affect the church and the much wider culture. But before we get to that, we want to speak briefly with Len Marino, who is EWTN's Vice President for Creative Services, to get an update on some new things happening at EWTN. Len, what do you have for us? Well, we've got a couple of things. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, we've got um, a, uh, a new open for our cinema. You know, because we do things like do opens, just like the one you just mm -hmm. saw to open your show. We've got a, a new book uh, for kids on the saints uh, written uh, by a, a woman that works for Church Pop. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a, a EWTN original documentary on the poet priest. And we'll roll some promos for that. Yeah, let's, you'll see. Let's, let's, take let's take a, a look. Let's take a quick look at some of these clips. <laughs> Hi, I'm Caroline Perkins, and some of you may know me from the videos I host on Church Pop, the EWTN News online service that's inspiring, informative, and fun. I've always believed it's never too early to introduce your little one to the communion of saints. My new book, ABC Get to Know the Saints with Me, is a fun and simple way to do just that. For each letter of the alphabet, your child will meet a church hero like St. Anthony, St. Faustina, St. John Paul II, and many more. Who knows, this could be the start of a lifelong friendship. ABC, Get to Know the Saints with Me by Caroline Perkins, the latest release from EWTN Publishing. Now available at EWTNRC.com or call 1-800-854-6316. For as long as we can remember, we've used art and writing to make sense of the beauty in the world around us. When we look at any individual thing and sense its structure, its beauty, we get a glimpse of the divine wisdom who crafts all things. But it takes a truly inspired and devoted heart to find God in the midst of tragedy. This isn't just a poem about a shipwreck. It's a theological meditation how Christ, the Lord of creation, is present even in such tragic events. Join Dr. Andrew Nash as he delves into the anthology of one of the most celebrated Victorian writers, Gerard Manley Hopkins, priest, poet. On the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. All right, so... These are some of the things that Creative Services is getting together for us? Yeah, getting together. Also, promote, you know, to promote those shows. I mean, to promote buying that book for the sure, kids, sure. you know, to promote that uh, original documentary. Yeah. And also, you know, the EWTN Cinema, you know, all of our movies that we show, yeah. that's the beginning of that. We also have liturgical websites. We have a lot of liturgical websites. I think they'll throw them up on the screen. Yeah, uh, I'll just mention that it's EWTN.com slash Advent, mm -hmm. EWTN.com slash Christmas, and EWTN.com slash Freelance. Yeah, let me talk to you about that. I mean, that... Uh, no, no, that's not a liturgical season. That is not a liturgical season. No, that is something that we're doing. Uh, that's a place where you can go. We're actually looking for, right now, uh, graphic designers that do print or do online, okay? Freelance, freelance graphic designers. They can work remotely. So if you want to look and find out more about that stuff, you can go to EWTN.com forward slash freelance. So that's what that website's about. All right. Okay. Well, Len. Well, thank you. Keep up the good work. We appreciate it. And we'll be back in just a couple of minutes with tonight's guest and our conversation about sacred music. So please stay with us.
Welcome back. Our guest tonight is an organist, lecturer, and the director of liturgical music at Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland. In addition, he is a conductor and has com uh, published uh, his compositions. He's also the founder and president of the St. Gregory Institute of Sacred Music in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he's here tonight to discuss the current trajectory of Catholic sacred music and how it can impact the church as well as our larger society. So please welcome Mr. Nicholas Will. Nicholas, welcome. Thank good you, to, Father. Good Pleasure to, to be here. here. Good to have you. First of all, how would you describe the way we already have been in liturgical music? What would be your perspective as a professional musician and writer of music? How would you see where we've been? In the last few decades or perhaps Sh since Well, Vatican you're II? a young man, so I guess we'll <laughs> yeah. have to just go a couple decades. Sure. Go, give me what you got. <laughs> I think there's been a tremendous amount of uh, very interesting development in sacred music over the past uh, 20 years mm -hmm. in particular. Oh, really? I mean, since Vatican II, and of course, didn't live through those times, but of course, very radical changes with regard to the liturgy and, and music. Um, the introduction of new styles of music. Mm -hmm. And in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, we've seen a renewed interest, I think, in the church's traditional musical forms, Gregorian chant and, and uh, Renaissance polyphony and things like that. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. Um, certainly, uh, the, the papacy of Pope Benedict XVI uh, did uh, much to draw to our attention the importance of sacred music and our, our liturgical music heritage. I, I think it's worth noting that Pope Emeritus Benedict was himself quite a fine musician. Oh, yes. You know, he yes. would just sort of, to, for fun, play Mozart. You know. Yes, yes. I, he spoke uh, and wrote uh, as a man who thoroughly understood music. And I think that uh, um, uh, we might not realize that uh, until many years down the road. You know, I, I think Pope Benedict uh, has written with an understanding of sacred music that really no other pope in the 20th or 21st century outside of maybe St. Pius X <coughs> has written. Uh, and uh, I think at the risk of speaking in, in generalities and painting with a broad brush, a lot of this interest in traditional sacred music uh, is amongst uh, younger generations, generations of Catholics, both uh, clerics and laity. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. Um, I, I think that uh, young people uh, have really approached a lot of this repertoire as completely blank slates. We didn't grow up hearing Gregorian chant. We didn't grow up hearing these no. things, didn't even know they existed. And then all of a sudden as young adults, when we maybe first uh, you know, walk into a mass where this music is employed or, or, or discovered in some other way, we're, we're discovering with, with completely fresh eyes and ears. And uh, in fact, I can, as another kind of confirmation of that uh, uh, idea, a few years ago, the top album was chant. Right, right. And it was <clears throat> monks in Spain chanting Gregorian chant, and this was super popular. Right. And folks didn't know Latin, you know, they didn't understand the right. words, but there was a beauty that was haunting, it was just uh, uh, captivating for so many young people. Right. It wasn't just old timers by any means. No, I think that speaks to, you know, humanity's natural desire for something otherworldly, right? Even if you're a non-religious person, mm -hmm. there's something about that music that mm -hmm. speaks to all humanity uh, yeah. sort of a, 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 on, a, on a primal level, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that's exactly right. That's a wonderful example. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I, I would speak for a gen another generation, uh, but I, I'd say that a lot of people my age I'm in my 70s. Uh, 
really react negatively. We can't use Gregorian chant. We're going backwards. And they start. <laughs> uh, sometimes we older folks start rocking anyway, and there's no rocker. But you know, going back to Latin and Gregorian chant really makes some people get upset because they feel like it's a reversal of evolution. We've evolved beyond that. Right. We we, we left that behind, <clears throat> and whereas folks who are much much younger, like you are. Um, can look at that and say, wow, this is so beautiful. And he, like you say, hear it without cultural background or, and or baggage. Right, exactly. And I wouldn't look at it so much as a turning back the clock. You know, we, we, we hear that term thrown around a lot, you know, going back in time. <laughs> I mean, I think that a lot of it is simply uh, uh, this is the natural evolution of the liturgical changes during and after Vatican II. Mm -hmm. Some pretty substantial changes to the liturgy at that time. It takes a long time for us to sort these things out, you know. Uh, 50, 60 years in the life of the church is a blink of an eye. Yep. And so I think we're only now coming to a more well-rounded organic understanding of what the council document said, what the council fathers intended, and so now we're able to, to look at the church's tradition uh, without looking at it through any cultural lens of the 1960s or 70s and say, well, no, this is an important part of who we are uh, as Catholics. The other thing, I think, is young people, by and large, uh, we want, uh, crave, yearn for things that are distinctively Catholic, right, mm -hmm. that we can hold on to. And, you know, we, we, most young Catholics don't want a sort of watered-down version of the, of the faith. We, we, mm -hmm. we want all of it, you know, uh, and uh, and the liturgy and music is part of that. We a lot of young people tend to be attracted to um, liturgical expressions that are authentically and unapologetically Catholic. One of the things that happened after the Council uh, in those, those first decades is that a myth about the spirit of Vatican II was created. And people would say, well, in the spirit of Vatican II, but what they would not do, and over the years I've come to suspect they could not do, was actually cite the Vatican Council. They wouldn't tell you, they'd say, well, the Vatican Council got rid of purgatory. Oh, yes. Where? Right. Uh, it got rid of <laughs> devotion to the rosary and Mary. Where? And one of the things that the Vatican Council definitely did not do is get rid of all Latin, especially the music. It says in the document on the liturgy, the Constitution on the liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, that... Latin is to have pride of place, exactly. especially for the ordinary parts of mass in the Roman Rite. And they mentioned the Roman Rite. Right. So uh, Greek, of course, for the Kyrie, right. but Latin for the Gloria, the Sanctus, the Credo, and the Agnus Dei, that they should have pride of place. And that's where some of our most beautiful music is. Exactly, yeah. I, I believe maybe it's paragraph 36 mm -hmm. in Sacra Santa Cachillian that says precisely what you're saying. And I once heard uh, fairly recently a priest say, well, the Mass can be celebrated in any language except for Latin. The, the Roman liturgy, the Latin liturgy can be celebrated in any language other than Latin. And, you know, it's, it's, almost, yeah, it's <laughs> almost, it's laughable, really. Well, uh, and it is, yeah, it's not almost laughable. <laughs> right, exactly. But uh, I think the Council Fathers realized, as you pointed out, um, jettisoning Latin would have uh, serious ramifications for yeah. us in terms of unity in terms of our, our heritage and our culture, uh, but particularly with, with regard to sacred music because our whole tradition, other than uh, some elements in Greek, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. is, is intimately tied up with that language. Now, in... Uh, uh, and, and as a matter of fact, it's 
good to point out, why do we have the Kyrie eleison, the Christe eleison in Greek? For the same reason. Mass had been celebrated in Greek in Rome into the third century. And so it was kept as a vestige of the original language of the Mass in Rome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've been, I know something of Roman history, and, and half of the citizens of Rome spoke Greek as their first language. Half. Half wow. in the first century. Wow. Now, by the third <clears throat> century, it was starting to be forgotten. People mm -hmm. weren't learning it anymore. But they had conquered Greece and Greek-speaking areas. There were a lot of Greeks sure. in, living in Rome. And Latin was a second language for them. And that's why it wasn't until the third century. Hmm. And ironically, um, when I hear people who say, we, you know, I'm not going to go to church unless it's in Latin. The first anti-pope had the same mentality, but for Greek. He said, we can't celebrate in Latin. We never <laughs> had mass in Latin. It's got to be in Greek. Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> same argument, different century, yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> different century, different language, but same argument. Right. But we, but we did keep that Greek vestige and we now keep these Latin vestiges. Right. It's, in some ways, living archaeology. Yes, you can see the layers. E exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. And you know, we, uh, you know, I'm by ritual in the uh, with the Maronite rite, and we do the same thing with Aramaic. Right. We maintain Aramaic for the most important elements of the liturgy. Other parts we do in Arabic or English as modern languages, but the core of it has this Aramaic root for the same reason. It's living liturgical archaeology. And it's very moving, by the way, especially to hear the words of institution. Yeah. You know, the very words, perhaps, that our yeah. Lord uttered at the, at the Last Supper. Yes. So... You're saying to me that now you youngsters <laughs> are coming to, here's a married man with his own kids. Um, not much of a youngster anymore, but you know, th but younger folks are interested in the beauty of Latin music and chant to be included in the repertoire of what we sing at Mass. I think that's fair to say. I mean, again, it's hard to pin down any one group of people or generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm coming at this uh, as a church musician, as a university professor, but uh, in a seminary uh, musician. But certainly that's a strong trend amongst young priests, amongst seminarians, and young Catholics in general. Uh, now, a lot of young people are also into... Um, you know, other types of uh, music, uh, liturgical expressions, praise and worship music, of course, is mm -hmm. very, very popular. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we're coming to maybe um, a more nuanced understanding of that sort of music's role in the life of the church and being able to distinguish between liturgical music and devotional music. See, the, <clears throat> how would, uh, you're a musician, how would you distinguish liturgical music and devotional music? Well, the church defines sacred music and liturgical music. She often uses those two terms interchangeably yes. mm -hmm. as music that is part of the liturgy. Mm -hmm. So music that was developed and composed uh, over the course of centuries along with the development of the Roman rite. You know, Gregorian mm -hmm. chant developed alongside the Roman rite. Right. As the Romans were beginning to worship in the uh, basilicas, large spaces, needed music for the entrance procession of the priest now. Right. There needed to be music for that, and so the introit was developed. And so uh, that music has, uh, for much of the history of the church, you know, been in Latin, been Gregorian chant, or music that's developed out of that organically. Mm -hmm. uh, devotional music's a little looser you know, does not need to be, um, even long before Vatican II, we had lots of devotional music in, in vernacular languages, tended to often be of a more folk idiom, mm -hmm. uh, you know, music to be made uh, in the home or in, in prayer groups, things of that sort. So there's always been room 
in the church where all of this. Right. I think our prob a lot of our problem lay in the fact that we wanted to do everything at Mass, and the church makes the distinction that just because something is inappropriate for Mass doesn't mean that it's bad. Right. It, That's right. It, it, it's an important thing uh, to, to keep that distinction because there's some music that we can use in devotional celebrations that y you don't have to have Mass going on. Exactly. And Mass has another element. Just like there are family dinners where you put out all the best silverware and plateware and all and the nice napkins. Then there are other times plastic and paper napkins <laughs> right. because the kids are eating uh, hot dogs and uh, beans, you know. Yes. So yeah, there's, there are different levels in all parts of human life. I'd like to, to maybe get a little bit of music in here so people Please. hear what this. We've got a little clip from um, uh, uh, an album called Firmum Est Cor. It's, uh, th this piece of music comes from the Pontifical North American College Choir, and it's um, uh, available at pnac.org and the typical streaming sites. So let's take take a listen to this. This will be uh, Christ Christus, uh, Hodie Christus, Hodie Christus. So let's take a listen to this. This is a type of music known as polyphony. It developed after chant, had yes. been around for a number of centuries. Yes. This is a, a type of music that emphasizes individual voices coming in harmony. That's the poly part, the right. many voices. Right. And you, you can't have a congregation sing along with this. This is no. something that would be heard as a meditation type of music during Mass, in this case, the Christmas Mass. Right. When people are receiving, coming on the line for Holy Communion or some other point of otherwise quiet, this meditative music would be used. Whereas chant, I've heard described as a humble music in which the individual voice is melded into the community in a simple kind of singing. Nobody is a star right. in Gregorian chant. Everybody sings together. Right. Would that be fair? Fair point, yes. Yeah, and within Gregorian chant or within chant you have uh, the full gamut of, of, of abilities yes. and difficulty. Yeah, yeah. Very simple chants for the congregation, for clerics, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and then sort of uh, middle, actually the simplest chants are for, for clerics, the dialogues and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for the congregation, you would have things uh, like the Gloria and mm -hmm. Sanctus and things like mm -hmm. that. And then you have some things that are more specialized too, mm -hmm. uh, the propers, the entrance chant, communion chant, offertory chant, the traditionally the choir, would sing. And then out of that tradition grew polyphony right. and originally would have been uh, often alternating with chant. So you'd have a little bit of chant and then a little bit of polyphony. And then once we get to about the 16th century though, polyphony really became 
quite popular and, and yes. most of the mass would have been occupied uh, by, by that type of music. And yes, it is uh, music, it's uh, difficult to render some of it and uh, uh, usually sung by, by specialists, although there are um, examples that can be sung by really um, in any choirs or a group of people that work hard enough at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, one of the high points of polyphony would be someone like Palestrina. Exactly. You know, in the 16th century. Um, and this develops further into eventually the opera comes out of that. You know, that in a lot of ways, there's that early opera. Um, but I, I think for us to see that this music uh, is something that also lifts us up. It elevates. Sometimes I fear that contemporary hymnology, the, the hymns of, say, the last 30 years or so, are sort of smoothing out the abilities and differences. And, even, and the, the bigger problem for me as a theologian is some of them are just you know, the words are practically nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that it doesn't make theological sense at all. It's focused on us. It, it emphasizes on how great we are instead of singing to God how great thou art. Right. And this is, I think, a horrible mistake. Chant always is focused on praise of God and proclamation of the faith. Fair point, yes. And just by its nature, you know, uh, chant is humble. As you pointed out, there are no stars in a chant choir, yeah. at least the, the, there shouldn't be. Um, it, yes, it, it's a, the texts have been a particular issue, I think, in a lot of sacred music written in the last uh, 40 to, to 50 years. And, and, you know, the church, in her wisdom, the Latin church in the West, has been very open to development. You know, we, that's what's allowed Palestrina, uh, Mozart, uh, all of the great composers mm -hmm. uh, throughout the centuries to write sacred music. Some of, some of humanity's greatest artistic achievements yeah. are found within this tradition. Yeah, now, like Bach's Mass in B minors. Yes, yes. Stupendous. Um, and he was Lutheran. He was, he was, yeah. Uh, other traditions have purposefully uh, stunted their tradition, you know, and said, no, we, we will not develop beyond this point. We, we will not use instruments, or we will not do this or that. Yeah. But in the West, we've been more open to development. Now that's a double-edged sword, yeah. right? Because it's brought us uh, incredible beauty and richness, but also mm, some things that are maybe not deserving of the temple. So we have to be yeah. very discerning yeah. as, as clergy, as musicians, uh, even as people in the pews, as to what is, is worthy and, and what is not. And, and particularly with texts, when we're introducing texts that aren't part of the liturgy itself, we have to be very careful. We also like to have uh, one more little clip. Um, if we could do something, uh, I think we got a clip of the Regina Chaley. Let's take a look at that. Again, that's from the album Firmum Est Cor Meum, My Heart is Firm, uh, performed by the Pontifical North American College Choir, uh, 
Check that out at pnac.org and all the other typical streaming sites. Um, yeah, this, this is uh, brings out not only a beautiful piece of polyphony, but one of the other elements of chant is that it includes some of the great Marian hymns, yes. like, like this one. And there hasn't been as much new Marian hymns. Um, that, that you don't see as much depth in that development because Marian devotion was put on the side in a lot of circles, uh, even though popularly you know, people you know, love Our Lady very much mm -hmm. and the rosary and praying to, to uh, uh, Our Lady's prayers are popular. So this is another thing that we can also recover, you know, from this great Latin tradition. Now, we have to take a break, but we want to come back because I know a lot of you have questions about the music in your parish and what you can do and maybe music that we do here and such. So call in and we'll try to get to your question. We'll be back in just two minutes. Welcome back, and we are ready to take your phone call. So let's start off with Dirk. Dirk, where are you calling from? Oh, good evening, Father Mitch Pacwa. I'm I, my name is Dirk. And I'm from Winnipeg, way up in Canada. Oh well, well, great. Good to, especially from here, it's way up. Good to have you on with us. What can we do for you today? I have a very simple question, Father Mitch. What can I do to bring chant and polyphony to our parish? Uh, let me ask you this, just as from my side, we'll get the musician with his professional background. Have you talked to your priest about it? Uh, yes, I, a couple priests, and I've also worked with a choir director. Uh, basically what happened was I used to belong to a choir, and... Uh, I was there for three years, and then when the priest retired, a new one came in, and he kind of threw us out. Unfortunately, we don't know why, and we tried since in other parishes, but it seems like it's very difficult in our city to introduce traditional sacred music. So I'm interested to know, what can I do to bring okay. chant and polyphony to our parish? That's good to know. What do you think, Nick? Yeah, this is, uh, can be difficult. Not all ground is equally fertile for, for this sort of thing. I often say for um, a music program, especially a traditional one, uh, to be successful, you need a few things to happen. First and foremost, you need the support of the pastor. You need time and patience and prayer, and you need funding, you know, usually. The, the, it takes resources to do this sort of thing. Without the first, unfortunately, there's not a lot that can be done. Um, those of us working in seminaries are working hard to rectify that problem, you know, to, to make sure that our, our younger, uh, our, our future priests are, are open to this sort of thing, and by and large, most of them are. Uh, so I would encourage you, Dirk, um, I don't know how, uh, um, you're in Winnipeg? Uh, he's not there now. Okay, okay. Yeah, he's in Winnipeg. Uh, so... I've seen great success um, with groups that are sort of traveling choirs, traveling scholas, mm -hmm. uh, who can reach out to parishes and say, we'd love to come to your parish and offer this, uh, you know, free of charge, uh, would you mind? And that's a wonderful way to introduce something because if a pastor wants to bring a group in one time, he might not 
ruffle as many feathers, right? Uh, it's a wonderful way to introduce this sort of thing. It's a good way for your musicians to maybe see some different churches in the area and to, to um, introduce more people to that type of music. So I, I would encourage you, Dirk, maybe to, to work on forming a group or, or trying to form a group with other like-minded people that might try traveling around a little bit more rather than being based in one particular parish. And, you know, I would also recommend that you get a number of younger people to be part of it so that what you were saying before about the interest that young people have in Gregorian chant and polyphony will be manifest. Well, I taught at the University of Dallas mm -hmm. for a number of years, and the number one student activity was the polyphony choir. That's great. That's Ten percent of the student body took part in the polyphony choir. That is wonderful. It really is. Yeah. It's, it's remarkable in some ways. Uh, and, and, and quite wonderful. And there may even be, look around in Winnipeg, that maybe there is a religious order that would welcome such a choir to practice. And get, this, now this is where the sneaky Jesuit in me <laughs> comes out. <laughs> but, you know, to find a way where you can maybe find a monastery or a right. convent where they would welcome you to practice and then also sing to the Lord. Maybe even offer a few special concerts where you do Easter music. It's too late for Christmas. Right. Do an Easter or a Holy Week special. Right. Those, that could be something quite nice. Oh, and, yes. And... It, I happen to know Winnipeg a little bit, and there are a couple dioceses next to each other. You might, you can cross the river and do things that way too. Maybe even check out the Ukrainian Catholic, Greek Catholic Cathedral. Do something with them, with their chant and with yours. Be creative. Uh, we have someone who called in, uh, John in Tennessee. Uh, he didn't want to be on the air though. I think I scared him. You wouldn't be a nice person. <laughs> what he wants to know is this. When did Gregorian chant begin? What, what did it originate? And how did chant develop in the West? And from what era is most of the chant from? When, uh, what part of church history did most of regular Gregorian chant come from? It's an excellent question, and yes. I'll try not to give too long of an answer. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, we know, or at least we believe pretty firmly, that from the earliest days of the church, there was some sort of singing involved. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have any recordings, obviously. We don't have any any written music. That was a church music was a completely oral tradition until about the ninth century. Because they didn't know how to write music. Yeah. Well, there was really no notation system. You know, yeah. I mean, the, the Greeks had a system, uh, the ancient Greeks that uh, uh, sort of influenced uh, our, our system in the West. But uh, probably in the early days, uh, you know, it was simple enough that it was just learned by rote. And, and what we inherited from uh, Judaism, you know, we're not completely mm -hmm. sure, but it's probably safe to assume that we, we took some perhaps some practices from them. Well, because uh, certainly one of the, th the way that the Liturgy of the Hours began is that they were chanting songs right. before Mass. Right. Especially on the uh, Saturday evening before Mass, they would chant psalms together. Right. And so, uh, again, just like Jewish people still do. Right. Now, so there were various types of chanting that developed regionally, and there was a specific type of chanting and repertoire in Rome. Now, what we call Gregorian chant is a fairly specific uh, type of music or, or body of music. Um, and that came about right around the time of Charlemagne, when the Roman rite was adopted in Gaul. And so what happened was, we think, the, the, the Roman melodies were, were adopted in Gaul, but the Frankish singers sort of changed them, tinkered with them, decorated them in a, a peculiarly uh, Frankish way. And, uh, and so folks understand, the Franks were not a family or something. Right. This was the tribe right. that became what we call the French today, but they exactly. had invaded 
along with other groups like the Burgundians and others, and the Franks lived in what's now France. Exactly. And around that time, a very large and powerful uh, barbarian kingdom. And uh, so that uh, came to be known as Gregorian chant. Right. In subsequent centuries, more melodies were added, really up until about the the 16th century, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you know the repertoire, you can sort of tell what's what's old, what's really ancient, mm -hmm. what's less ancient, and what's sort of new. Um, but to answer the question, those melodies came about over a quite a long period of time, mm -hmm. really about uh, 1,500 years. Mm -hmm. But most of what we call Gregorian chant, things like the entrance antiphons and offertories and things like that, most of those would have been uh, composed or, or, or adapted right around uh, maybe the uh, 8th, 9th, 10th centuries, 11th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this um, is an interesting period. Uh, you know, we, it, it, one of the things about European history is that it was, you know, experienced lots of warfare in various ways. I mean, there was the barbarian invasions uh, that brought the Franks and Burgundians and others into Europe back in the fourth through the end of the sixth century. But then there were new invasions mm -hmm. again after Charlemagne and the, especially the late ninth, 10th, 11th centuries. And then things settled down. And in those periods of settlement, there were flourishing of monasteries. Lots of people joined monasteries, huge. And that's when they would develop new hymns. Exactly. And they started to write down the melodies during this time, yes, too, for the first time. they learned how to write music. Right. Uh, out of necessity. You have all these people that now need to learn these melodies. You need to be able to write them down and devise a system mm -hmm. where, where you can teach them to others. And so, uh, uh, but it took quite a long time for that, for that to happen. Yeah, a lot of times folks don't understand that the concept of the Dark Ages mm. was a late concept. That the Dark Ages weren't called Dark Ages mm -hmm. until the 1600s. And that's because they saw themselves as the rationalistic enlightenment. Sure. Whereas during the Dark Ages, they thought they were modern. Right, right. <laughs> Well, and, and in those periods, it's the monks who did almost all the inventing. Right. They're, and w one of their inventions uh, was writing down music. Exactly. And, of course, we look at architecture and art of the period and, yes. and how anyone could consider those the Dark Ages is yeah. uh, ridiculous. Yeah, I know. No, it's, it's a period of, of dealing with rebuilding. Right after barbarians invaded and that rebuilding was done and, and inspired by monks. We, we cannot underestimate the importance of St. Benedict and his monks in those centuries. Precisely. Yeah. It's you know, one of the things to go back to one of the callers that we had about what he can do. One of the things you've done and I guess it's you and maybe some others, start this St. Gregory Institute. What is that? Yes, uh, the St. Gregory Institute of Sacred Music is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the training of um, church musicians in traditional Catholic sacred music. Mm -hmm. That's the, the, the short definition. Um, so we teach classes on Gregorian chant, on conducting, uh, organ lessons. Uh, I'm teaching a history of sacred music course this semester. Uh, all sorts of different things. We have a certificate of sacred music that one can complete in a calendar year. And uh, I founded the organization for a couple of reasons. In my work as a church musician, as a university professor and at the seminary, I, I, I was finding a lot of people who were good musicians maybe even working as church musicians, but they didn't actually know a lot about church music. Mm -hmm. They're sort of faking mm -hmm. their way through, or maybe their education was a little lacking in some areas. Uh, or maybe, you know, you have a, a, a new young pastor who wants 
Gregorian chant and these things, but his musician, who is a very fine musician, doesn't, doesn't know how to do these things. And there are a number of organizations doing wonderful educational work in, in uh, week-long um, uh, courses, week-long festivals, and things like that. And of course, we have great institutions of higher learning and conservatories in, in the United States educating people as well, but there wasn't anything in between. And so I really envisioned the St. Gregory Institute as a vocational school of sorts for church musicians. And because we're small, uh, it's very modestly priced, and, uh, uh, and, and we feel that we can give students uh, a very good education and training in sacred music, always grounded, uh, uh, always grounded in singing in the liturgy, making music in the liturgy, mm -hmm. and all, always striving to be uh, thinking uh, along with the mind of the church. So that the gentleman who had called from Winnipeg could contact you and, and informing a choir that goes on, they could get some training from the St. Gregory Institute. We'll By put, all means, yes. We'll put that information up there on the screen later. We have another caller. Hello, Martin? Yes, hello. Hi, where are you calling from? Pennsylvania. Great. It's a big state. Where are you at? Uh, outside of Allentown. Okay, great. Good to have you. So yep. what is your question? Well, I was going to talk a little bit about in between Gregorian chant and uh, modern uh, you know, the current disco era, the, there was all the hymns that we sang when I was in a cathedral choir back in grade school, which came out of the 18th and 19th centuries, and they were singable by the congregation. And a lot of the new songs are written since the 1960s. It seems like the composers are looking to, you know, show something that's so unusual that people are going to notice them, and it's unsingable by the congregation. And we've got congregations that don't sing now, and when they do use the older hymns, people can sing them. And I was just wondering if you could comment on that, because they wrote lousy hymns in the old days, but they didn't continue in the hymnals because people didn't, couldn't sing them. So I, I'll, uh, I'll let you go, and I'll just hang up here at Majora and Bear Gloria. Thank you Thank very you. much. Uh, Jesuit educator. <laughs> so, um, so what do you think of that? That's an excellent question. Yes, we, we're talking about Gregorian chant and polyphony, and, and polyphony in these things, but it's important to remember too that there has uh, long been a tradition of vernacular hymn singing in the church yep. dating long before Vatican II yeah, yeah. And, and not invented by Martin Luther either. No. You know? I'd be very curious uh, uh, to, to know if Martin grew up in an ethnic parish, you know, because yeah. particularly in a lot of the uh, Eastern European, Southern European ethnic parishes. Some of the German parishes. Oh, certainly. The, yes. the German uh, hymns were, were easily translated into English. Yes. yes. Um, and and some, some of the others too. So yeah, I mean, you know, you, you go to St. Florian's church and everybody can join in Sabdesh Yes, you know, exactly. That, that is, an aspect of our, our tradition that has unfortunately been neglected too. Because yeah. in, in our rush to, uh, um, to, to sing vernacular hymns, um, we kind of ignored what we already had. Now, a lot of those weren't in English, you yeah. know. Um, but uh, there are places that still maintain those traditions, thankfully, some places that, mm -hmm. are, that are trying to, to revive them. Um, so much of it in the States, I think, was, was, was wrapped up in, in uh, uh, immigrant populations who, who still spoke uh, their mother tongue uh, in addition to English. And so sometimes it's a little bit to, difficult to carry on that tradition with the same kind of uh, fervor. But he's exactly right. Martin's exactly right about uh, you know, saying that they wrote lousy hymns in the old days, too. We just don't have them anymore. And that it's exactly right because they just... They just fade away. That'll be the case with modern hymns. We don't have that benefit with what's written today. Yeah. And so. Oh, well, it'll you know. go away. <laughs> so we have another caller. Thomas, where are you calling Hi, from? Hi, how are you? Fine. Where are Me you calling from? Michigan, Troy, Michigan. Great. And what is your question? Well, I, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, I, I sometimes I feel the music is too sad in the Gregorian and, the, and in the chanting and the, and the other hymns. And I'm used to hearing, like, uh, City of God or sing a new song. To me, they sound more happy in the church. And when I hear the other, other music, it sounds more sad, and I feel too solemn, you know. Ah, uh, well, that's an interesting comment. Mm -hmm. 
Because uh, uh, Gregorian chant does have a solemnity. It's not sad, but it is solemn. I often say to my students who are studying these, this type of music, the worst thing you can do is perform this music, offer this music poorly, you know, too slowly, you know. Oftentimes we hear, especially as, as, as people are, are starting out, and I don't mean to say this to, to uh, dissuade anyone from doing it, but um, if you perform Gregorian chant very slowly and, and you know, uh, somberly, yes, it, it can be it can be a bit of a downer, you know. Now, within Gregorian chant, we have incredible variety. Some of it is rather uh, somber. Some of it is incredibly jubilant yeah. and joyful, you just know, like any other type of music. Right, right, right. right. Uh, so I don't know the situation. Tenebrae is supposed to be exactly. very somber. Exactly. But exactly. the Easter music can be very uplifting oh, and joyful. Oh, the, the Regina Chaley chant yeah, yeah. that you mentioned, one example. So that may be, that may be part of it, you know, it may yeah. be the actual rendering of it. I, I've heard Gregorian chant uh, on, on one album that it was sung at a at a clip, mm -hmm. and it it really lilts along where if you speed up. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, uh, and, and has a, a a drive to it that. So I, I think that might be one of the things, Martin, is uh, you just got to get people to put a fire under their backside and. Speed that up. <laughs> well, and, and two, I think we, we can have a, an honest discussion about what terms like happy or uplifting mean. Yes. Right? Because these gradations in chant that we're talking about are subtle. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we know, we are very stimulated in our society today, over, <laughs> overstimulated. And so our ability to pick up on subtle subtlety, subtle joy, quiet joy, is it takes us a little bit of time maybe to recover that ability. Yeah. And I think that might be part of the issue too. I want to put up the information. This the St. Gregory Institute.org. Saint is spelled out. And also you can get the album Firmum Est Core, performed by the Pontifical North American College. Uh, just go to PNAC.org and the other streaming sites. Nick, we've run flat out of time. Thank you very much for being with us and giving us some of these insights on music. And may the Lord bless you in this great season of Advent, keep you healthy and safe. The Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill so we can pay our bills too. Thank you. <laughs>